Welcome to another episode of Marxism with my fellow editors and fellow Marx, Mark Levecki and uh, Mark Melton. Uh, I, of course, am Mark Tooley, and uh, we are with Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy. We're doing several pieces uh, from this week, uh, starting with an article from not Reinhold Niebuhr, but his brother, Richard Niebuhr, who unusually uh, published a piece in Reinhold's Christianity in Crisis in 1946, unusually because uh, Reinhold and Richard uh, disagree on, uh, I think, the underlying premises of Christianity in Crisis. And uh, Richard, although the Marx can correct me, was mostly pacifist, unlike his uh, brother Reinhold, who disavowed pacifism before World War II. But uh, in this piece, uh, Reinhold uh, warns against uh, pragmatic utilitarian Christianity. We'll also take a look at a piece on uh, the anniversary of uh, the explosion in uh, Beirut, uh, whose uh, implications continue to ripple out in uh, unpleasant ways in Lebanon. And finally, a piece by Mark Lebecki on um, what's called incremental disarmament, suggested in a um, online conversation hosted by a Vatican commission with some uh, potentially concerning implications. So starting out with uh, Richard Niebuhr, uh, my recollection of uh, Richard is that uh, in response to the Japanese uh, invasion occupation of Manchuria, his council was essentially uh, hands off. Uh, Christians simply need to be patient and not interventionists uh, with which uh, Brother Reinhold strongly disagreed. In this 1946 piece, uh, Richard uh, argues against a, as I mentioned, a, a pragmatic uh, Christianity that sees the faith simply for its uh, social utility. There are several responses to uh, Richard uh, warning that uh, Christians are not just focused on eternity, but also the historical relativity of Christianity and what can be practically accomplished according to the dictates of the faith and to ignore the pragmatic implications is a form of escapism. So uh, Mark Lebecki, your thoughts? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, you, you, you know, I'll split the hair a little bit and say that both Richard and Reinhold as a set of brothers were both in principle pacifists. Uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, sort of our, you know, founding father, uh, went beyond that because of the historic uh, necessities and a, a realist assessment of what it meant to be a Christian in the world. So I, I, I still believe that Reinhold, uh, I don't believe, I assert, Reinhold thinks that Christians ought to be pacifists because the ethic of Jesus was pacifistic. Uh, he just believes that that ethic collides with another ethic, which is an ethic of responsibility, and that we can't do both ethics in this world, so we should be responsible uh, rather than uh, faithful to the to the love ethic, or at least 100% faithful to the love ethic, simply because if we strive for love, we'll get neither love nor responsibility. If we strive for responsibility, we'll make a little responsibility, and maybe a bit of love can qualify the responsibility, um, which is why it's Reinhold and not Richard, who's the founding father of, of Providence. Um, the, the article in question is interesting, right, because... Uh, Richard complains about the very thing that I think makes Reinhold so strong. And it's this, it's what he says as a pejorative, a realist assessment of history. Uh, and in one of the responses to him, I, I think it's something of a defense of the realist assessment of history, but it's also done so in a sort of maybe begrudging way where they, they talk about how uh, the pacifist might scorn uh, consequence, uh, but the pragmatist in response to this believes in judgment by consequences. Uh, but then he sort of takes a sidestep and he notes, well, he says, look, you know, the, the realist assessment of history goes in the direction that says, well, we're responsible for resisting tyranny. But he asserts, if they assessed it a different way and thought that pacifism or non-resistance was an effective hedge against tyranny, well, then they would just go that direction as if I think to argue the pragmatist is only concerned about consequences. Uh, and so if I have a critique of the critique of, of Richard Niebuhr, then the critique would be uh, that this idea of, of 
pragmatism being a judgment by consequences is fine, so long as we don't think, as I think the author suggests, that these are somehow like freestanding consequences. Like the Christian ethicist is like a single cell organism that has either an ah response to stimulation or an ug response to stimulation. Uh, the Christian ethicist goes somewhere beyond that. Our, our judgment of consequences uh, aren't freestanding consequences, but it's a recognition that these consequences have to be set against an azimuth, you know, a fixed point on a very particular moral horizon that we do not determine, that is determined for us by the, the will of God and the word of God, and against which we assess consequences. So one of those marks might be stewardship. Uh, we talk about how stewardship is the, the proper exercise of dominion, which is part of what it means to be made in the image of God, and that this dominion is providential care over creation. So a sovereign authority who has his own set of moral responsibilities for the preservation of the justice, the peace, and the order of, of the political polity uh, has a fixed standard against which to assess consequences. And this is in consequentialism in terms of, you know, sort of the C word of consequentialism. This is simply how ethics work. Um, we have to be concerned about outcomes uh, and certain outcomes bring us closer towards shalom than other outcomes. Uh, and that's, that's not a, an idolatry of consequence. That's simply recognizing that uh, responsibilities conflict in this world. And when we have to evaluate which responsibility to meet, uh, one good way to do that is an assessment of consequences and, and where our actions bring circumstances. Uh, so in that sense, a uh, great response to Richard, but I would want to put a fine point on what it means to judge by consequence. Mark Belton, uh, Richard advocates that the church uh, abjure all uh, utilitarianism and uh, move forward with quietness and confidence, which almost sounds rather passive. You were not uh, satisfied with some of the responses to uh, Richard. You thought they partly uh, misunderstood him. Your thoughts? Well, yeah, that's partially just my understanding of what I think Richard is kind of getting at, because on the one hand, like he's known at this point as already being a critic of social gospel. And I think some of the people who were responding were supporters of the social gospel or some version of it. And so to me, when I read Richard, though, he he's, is talking about kind of like social gospel. I think he's talking about something broader that can be applied to either the left or the right. Also, individuals or, you know, churches and organizations on a more social scale. And so, in other words, like the point of the utilitarian is using the religion for an end that is not religious. And to me, I'm understanding religion or the religious ends are kind of twofold. One, to help Christians love God more honestly and sincerely. And then two, loving neighbors um, the way Christ loves us. In other words, laying down your life for your neighbors. Now, within that, there's a lot of broad st stuff, but he's criticizing specifically the FCC, the federal, uh, what is it, the Federal Commission of Churches, whatever the... Um, federal Council of Churches. Right. And so, which was actually an organization that Christianity and Crisis reports on a good bit, and so I'm assuming they're kind of favorable to it. And so he's criticizing them. And basically they were saying like, during this moment in post-World War II, when we have so much conflict in the world, Christianity can be used to help people uh, have a fullness of life, to help people, uh, you know, create better peace and better order. And his argument is basically, that's not how the religion works. You can't, you, it doesn't, spreading Christianity doesn't guarantee a more peaceful world by itself. Um, now there can be byproducts of that. And he talks about some of those. And to me, like when I read this, like I can think of one, how individuals can have a utilitarian uh, faith. In other words, like, you know, I give the example of like sending your kids to church, not because you not primarily out of love of God, but primarily because you want them to be well behaved. It doesn't always work out that way. And if it doesn't work out that way, then it can challenge people's faith. And I've seen people kind of use this utilitarian Christianity in my own life where they're disappointed with the results because they thought if I am good, then I will get X, Y, and Z. And sometimes you get X, Y, and Z, but sometimes you don't, at least not in this lifetime. And so uh, that's where I think he's coming from. And then like on the broader scale, like I still think we see both on the left and the right, a 
desire to use Christianity for this or that purpose. Uh, for instance, um, there was a Congress or a Senate, Senate candidate out of Ohio who recently talked about instilling God in the workplace. To me, I don't think that is to me is using religion for a non-religious end. And I think uh, Richard is right for that critique. And so the critiques though, I think are, they hit on some points, but I think they miss the broader point that he's trying to make. I think they're kind of qualifying what, they're, what he's saying, but overall, I think he is saying that there are good ends that Christianity can lead to. I give a couple of examples. For instance, during the troubles of Northern Ireland, Christian, um, I, think, I think it was a Catholic priest who helped the communities kind of come together. And it was basically the church was the only organ that could facilitate this, um, the conflict between the Protestants and the Catholics and to kind of bring these groups together to create the peace accords. Now that doesn't mean that if you want to create peace in society, you put everyone in a church pew. It doesn't, it's not going to work out that way. So there can be positive byproducts, but to expect that is um, misunderstanding what the purpose of the religion is and what the religion can do. And I think the reason why the church isn't going to be able to guarantee peace if you put everyone into the pew is because of depravity. Like we're, even once you become Christian, you're still a sinner. And so, and you still have sinful desires. And so just becoming a Christian or making sure everyone around you is Christian isn't going to lead to the um, utopia or the very, um, the, the non-religious ends that you may desire. And so that to me is like, so how I primarily understood Richard. And then that when I read these other responses, I think they're coming from more of a defending a social gospel um, considering they've written books about that um, perspective, so. Mark Lebecki, uh, turning to uh, incremental disarmament, that uh, suggestion that came out of a integral a webinar. What's that? Integral. It integral. was not increment, integral disarmament. Yeah. Uh, pardon me, you'll have to uh, explain exactly what that means. It was suggested during a, a webinar co hosted by a, a Vatican commission and seems to be part of the trajectory under the current papacy, uh, rejecting the church's traditional. Uh, just war teaching in favor of alternatives. What are these alternatives? Bad. Hmm. The alternatives are bad. Uh, integral disarmament, I don't know quite what work integral is doing there, but integral disarmament apparently is, is not a terribly new idea, but it's, it's a coalescence of several ideas that suggest, for instance, that weapons, uh, military weapons are inherently evil. Uh, that they always do more evil than they are intended to prevent, uh, and that Christians, therefore, uh, should simply have no part in them, and that the best thing for all of humanity uh, is to disarm completely. Uh, they don't touch on whether or not it should be a unilateral disarmament, like should the, you know, should the good guys, should the West disarm first, and then just sort of hope that the sole force of that moral example is enough to dissuade or persuade uh, our enemies to disarm. They don't really get into the, the nitty gritty, but that's the, that's the statement. Weapons are bad, they do no good, cause more harm than they prevent, and Christians should have nothing to do with them, therefore we should all disarm. Uh, I respond to this by suggesting that it's a, it's a great idea, except that it goes against Christian tradition, uh, it goes against reason, and it leads to the abandonment of one's flock. So other than that, it's, it's a grand scheme. Uh, you know, Pope Francis, you know, God bless his soul, uh, seems to want several things that he cannot have given the way that reality functions. So, you know, on the one hand, uh, I use the example in the article where he, he condemns uh, Western leaders' response uh, to the Holocaust uh, using the example of aerial photos that we have of the Auschwitz-Birkenau death camps. Uh, that were inadvertently taken when we were probably doing reconnaissance photos of a nearby uh, uh, oil refinery, not oil refinery, but a, uh, a rubber plant. Uh, he laments that uh, the Allied leaders did not drop bombs on those railway, railroad lines to try to stop the Holocaust, uh, in the same breath almost that he's denouncing weapons entirely. Uh, so he seems to recognize that weapons have a function, at least tacitly he recognizes this, and at the same time he laments that we even have them. Um, and it's not even just lament that we have them, like we can lament that we have them, that's fine. Um, but because we have to have them, we ought not to lament, uh, you know, the fact that we invest in arms and we use them. 
uh, I do know that it goes against tradition, as you've already suggested, his his position and the position of the, the integral disarmament uh, advocates uh, goes against just war teaching, uh, which is to say that it goes against um, the, the bulk of Christian intelligence since uh, the early church forward. Uh, this term, uh, integral disarmament, is that the first you've heard of this term? And is it only used in this web webinar or has it come from any official Vatican statement? Not that I recall. Not that I recall. Um, I never, I, I, like I said, I don't know what word, in, or what work Integral is doing. I don't know what, how, how, how those two terms come together. Um, when you sent me the link, that was the first I had ever heard of it, um, which means nothing. I mean, it might be something that's, you know, that's very well known, um, but it goes against the tradition. You know, there's no way that you can, that you can find coherence between that and anything that's been said um, within the just war tradition. It goes against reason, as I've suggested. I, I, weapons are not inherently evil. Um, I, I, you know, I, this is uh, contentious, but I think you could push that all the way down to even the most ghastly weapons, uh, poison gas, things like that. Uh, any, any kind of weapon system uh, that, that we presently have or have had uh, can have a practical function uh, that could be used morally. You know, poison gas is heinous and ghastly, but maybe it was the only thing that could have, you know, pushed the Japanese out of their tunnel systems on those Pacific islands, and maybe would have prevented, uh, probably not, but maybe would have prevented some of the mass slaughter uh, that happened because we could only do so conventionally. Um, and then I suggested it's an abandonment of your flock because, you know, if if the Pope is serious about the West disarming, um, you know, the only people who benefit from that are the people who mean to destroy the West. So it's, I mean, it's incoherent. Uh, and it's an abdication of the moral responsibility of political leadership. Um, it's just, it's, it's frustratingly yet one more thing that leads, you know, too many people to call him, you know, Francis the hippie pope. Well, on that somewhat sarcastic note, uh, we will conclude uh, this episode of Marxism. I should mention that uh, Providence uh, plans to host a conversation in person at our Washington office later this month with Mark Lebecki, uh, reflecting on the anniversaries of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and uh, Japan's uh, surrender, hopefully with a respondent to flesh out these uh, issues further and possibly relate them to the topic of uh, integral uh, disarmament. So uh, stay tuned. And uh, Mark Melton, tell us what you're doing for the rest of the summer. Anything fun and exciting? Well, I'm going to take a week off. So that's going to be fun. Can you tell us what you're going to do during that week, or is that confidential? Oh, my mom's in town, so <laughs> we'll be, I don't know what we're going to be doing. So, well, bring her uh, by the office. What's that? Bring her by the office. Yes, we'd love to meet her. Mm -hmm. Y'all have. She came to a dinner once. Yeah. Oh, like I forgot. Yes. Well, that's been several years. Yes. And uh, Mark Levecki, you're at an undisclosed location on the uh, somewhere in the North Atlantic. I'm a satellite campus of uh, Providence and IRD on the coast doing um, um, watching for German submarines, watching for German submarines and uh, and whatnot. Yeah, somebody's got to do it. Well, uh, very good. Thank you, gentlemen, for another uh, provocative conversation and this episode of Marxism. Until next week. Bye bye.